Assalamu alaikum everyone. Thank you all for attending. Uh, sounds clear, uh, Adar? Yes. Yeah, sir. yeah, thanks uh, a lot everyone and thank you for attending. Um, our session today is special with Mr. Riyan Sadi. He is a senior cybersecurity consulting and uh, we are actually proud to, uh, you know, host him in our session uh, today and Owas Priyad. Again, thank you so much guys for attending. Uh, Mr. Atuf will take over and introduce uh, Riyan in more details. Atuf, please go ahead. Yeah. Assalamu alaikum everyone. Uh, thanks everyone for uh, joining the session. We have uh, Riyan uh, Saati with us. Just to give a brief introduction, I'll not take much of time. So Ryan Sadi is a uh, senior cybersecurity consultant who is focused on pen testing, vulnerability assessment, as well as red teaming engagements. Ryan holds a master's degree in cybersecurity from Johns Hopkins. And he also was a lecturer previously at uh, King Abdullah University. And he also served as an advisor for multiple entities. He holds some of the most prestigious certifications like OSEP, OSCE, OSCP, GPEN, CRTE, CRTO, and uh, many more, which we couldn't write in here because of the space. So uh, I would now like to invite uh, Rayan and uh, please uh, Rayan join in. Sure. Thank you very much, Atif and uh, Rayan. Okay, uh, let's get started. Good evening, everyone. I hope you're doing fine. Um, let's, so let's just skip this introduction just because uh, I already did it. Okay, so um, let's start with this. So why should I talk about this topic now? Um, as I've mentioned before, uh, I've been in the academia and the industry as well. And it seems that most people don't really understand what's going on with this. Uh, they just know that the S in HTTP makes the uh, connection secure, which may not always be the case. Uh, in fact, you can actually get a certificate uh, very easily for your malicious website. Uh, this doesn't make it a legit website, as you know. Uh, with the all we do that all the time, actually, uh, during our assessments, mainly because it also helps with encrypting the traffic of our payload. So we get the certificate so that we can use it in the payloads as well. Um, I've also seen some people saying that if a website is not using HTTPS, then it is malicious. This is also uh, not necessarily true. It can be a legit website, but the communication with it um, is not secure. So there's a difference between these two that some people may have misconfusing. Yeah. Um, I've also seen people saying that they are cybersecurity professionals and they tell people that the lock in the URL makes it secure, which again, um, is something we're gonna talk about in a minute. Uh, some people also claim that it is related to the version itself of the protocol, which is partially true. We're gonna talk more about that uh, later on. Um, so just to make things clear, this is not your typical um, HTTP versus HTTPS talk. I will be diving a little bit into more details regarding this topic. However, this is only meant to be an exposure to the topic. Uh, so it won't be very mathy or complicated or stuff like that. Uh, so without further ado, let's talk about most of these reasons and more. Okay, so first of all, um, this protocol is widely used. It is a very um, like widely used protocol. So basically a vulnerability in it or in an application that implements it will result in millions of websites being exposed, uh, including uh, big companies' websites. So I'm talking things like Amazon, Google, and stuff like that. Um, for instance, in 2014, when the heart lead vulnerability was discovered, a lot of major websites such as GitHub, Amazon, AWS, Reddit, Wikipedia, Yahoo, and much more were vulnerable to it. 
um, some government entities temporarily shut down their servers at the time. Uh, this includes uh, countries like Canada and other countries all over the world. Uh, to be honest, this was actually the right decision uh, at that time. Now, I will be talking more about Heartbleed later on. So if you haven't heard of it before, don't worry, we'll cover this as well. Okay, so let's give you some appetizers here. Um, do you think this is secure? I don't know if anyone can actually answer. Um, anyway, so this is not necessarily secure. As I mentioned, maybe the website itself is malicious, but it is hosting um, an SSL or TLS certificate. So if it's using it, this doesn't mean that the website is secure. It just means that the traffic is encrypted. Now, we know this because of the lock, right? How about this one? This one is saying it is not secure. Um, again, as I mentioned, this is not necessarily the case, but this just means that the basically the communication is not encrypted. Okay, let's see something a little bit more interesting. Now, you can actually register a domain name with emojis, which means that you can use the lock emoji as part of the domain. Now, you can see here that we have google.ws and there is an emoji um, lock before it. Now, don't worry, you cannot really register a .com or .net or .org domain with emojis, but this is just something to prove that emojis is not really, uh, I mean, the lock doesn't really mean that um, the website is actually even using TLS or not, okay? Okay, so let's talk a little bit about certificates. We mentioned them uh, earlier, but we didn't really explain what it is. I'm not going to go very deep into this, uh, but I'll briefly explain what you need to know for this topic. Uh, there is something called CA, which is a certificate authority um, that verifies websites, SSL or TLS certificates. Uh, most browsers have a list of CAs that they trust, uh, which is essentially how we trust uh, TLS and SSL certificates as individuals. Uh, usually there are two types of certificates that are used. Uh, the first one is the self-signed. This is basically where you act as the CA. This may be a good, uh, this may be good enough for companies like Google because they are their own CA. However, for small companies, this will usually not be enough for others to trust you. The second option, which is the, um, the more used one is having um, a signed by a trusted CA certificate. Uh, this will not be free of charge usually. You will actually have to pay um, a CA for this, such as VeriSign or any other CA that you want. Yeah, you can get the slides, it's fine. Um, anyway, so let's go back to the presentation. Okay, so. A uh, certificate may also be available for free with some CDNs, such as Cloudflare. I know Cloudflare has it as part of their, um, I think, pro uh, subscription or something like that. Not the free version. Uh, it comes with the, the other one, basically. Okay, so just a couple of notes to know. If a website has a signed certificate that is valid, it doesn't really mean that the website is not malicious. And if a website has a self-signed certificate, it does not mean that it is malicious. So this is just a couple of things to um, have a note on. Okay, so here is actually an example of a self-signed certificate. Now, since the browser doesn't really know the certificate authority in this case, it will show this error, even though the website is using TLS. So this website may actually be secure uh, or even in the, um, the communication between the server and the client is secure. However, since it is a self-signed one, um, Google Chrome will not really recognize it because it doesn't know the CA behind it, right? Okay, so let's imagine a scenario where a CA gets compromised. As I said, we trust CAs. So if they were compromised, we will still trust them until we revoke that certificate. Uh, this means that if we were able to compromise the CA, we can issue certificates for big websites and cause a lot of sleepless nights for CAs, companies, even the customers, uh, the browsers, um, and probably the whole internet because everyone 
is trusting some CA certificates. Um, Google Chrome has a whole list of it, um, Safari, Firefox, IE, all of the browsers have, uh, they get shipped with certain CAs that they trust by default. Now, when a CA is compromised, with high probability, it will be um, basically out of business in no time. So the company behind it will actually be out of business. Uh, this happened in 2011 with a CA called DigiNoter. I think this is how it's pronounced. Uh, it got bankrupt basically in weeks after the incident, after it was uh, compromised. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the protocol itself. So SSL or TLS is used to encrypt or secure a number of reliable protocols such as HTTP, SMTP, and so on. Now, these are the, the two more um, commonly used ones. There are others that actually use it. I'm not just gonna talk about um, everything else. So this talk, as I said, it will not go deep into the protocol itself. Rather, it will be an intro to it and some of the critical vulnerabilities and exploits in it. Okay, so why do we use SSL or TLS? Let's consider that we don't have it, okay? Um, now, here's our first threat model that we have. Uh, now, a communication between the person A uh, and the person B can be easily viewed by a passive adversary, uh, where he can see the whole communication. Uh, for those of you who don't know, this is basically called a man in the middle attack. Okay, now this is the first threat model. The, the adversary here is not actually doing anything. He's just reading the communication, seeing the traffic, and basically uh, not doing anything with it. Okay, now the second threat model is a little bit more um, interesting, let's say. Now, the communication between person A and person B can be easily viewed and modified by an active adversary where he can see and manipulate the whole communication, meaning that he can send what he wants and ignore what he doesn't want. Um, again, this is also called a man in the middle attack. But in this case, it's actually an active version of it. Now, this will cause not only confidentiality to be uh, compromised, even uh, integrity and availability as well. Okay, so in other words, for those of you who are new to cybersecurity, this is basically a real example of what is happening under the hood. Uh, now, in the first version, Helen tries to log in into her account at example.com, for instance, uh, which is not really using TLS. Now, a man in the middle attacker will be able to see her credentials in clear text, as you can see, ABC123, right? Carol, on the other hand, tries to log in into her account at example.com, which is using TLS. Now, a man in the middle attacker will not be able to see her credentials in clear text. You would actually need to decrypt the, the communication in order to be able to find the password. Now, we will talk about this a little bit later. Uh, having a TLS by itself doesn't, or SSL doesn't really mean that you are secure. Um, there are certain cases where this encryption can be uh, basically decrypted. Okay, so just a little bit of the history. Now, SSL version one was actually born at Netscape in about 1994. It was actually never released because it was insecure from the beginning, okay? SSL version two was actually the real starting point of SSL encryption. It was released in 1995 and it had a lot of problems including export keys, which we will talk about later on. Um, SSL version three was, re was released a, a year later, so 1996. Uh, it had list flaws, but contained a lot of huge security risks as well, which we will also cover some of. Um, then eventually there's TLS 1.0. Now this is a little bit interesting. So the name was changed, even though it is the same protocol essentially, uh, because Microsoft declined to join and improve the protocol unless the name is actually changed. So they agreed and then they changed the name to be able to have Microsoft on their team which resulted in TLS 1.0 to be born in 1998. Now, TLS 1.1 was released in 20, uh, 2006, followed by TLS 1.2 in 2008. And finally, TLS 1.3, which is not really used a lot in um, 2018. Okay. 
Now, it is really worth to note that SSL of TLS is actually a very flexible protocol, which is both good and bad. It has many options, so we'll talk about some of them. Um, one of the most important things to note is that it allows for backwards compatibility. So if you have TLS 1.0, you can actually downgrade to, TL to SSL version 3 and SSL version 2 and so on. So you should know where this is heading right now. Okay, so let's talk about the negotiation phase. Now, this is kind of like a three-way handshake, but for SSL or TLS, I'm not gonna explain the whole handshake because it's a lot of, a lot of information to grasp, uh, but I'm just gonna explain the, um, the most important aspects for this presentation specifically. So in this case, there's something called negotiation, negotiating capabilities. Now, the client will start by listing um, the protocols it supports and the cipher suites it supports, which is called the client hello. Okay. Now, for this, in this case, for instance, the client is telling the server, "Hey, I speak SSL version three and TLS 1.0. Um, I also support this cipher suites X and Y." Now, this is basically the client hello, as I mentioned. Um, so this is the first aspect. Then the server will then choose the strongest protocol and the strongest cipher suite from the list that the client sent, okay? Now this is called server hello. So in this case, the client will actually, I mean the server will actually choose TLS 1.0 and whatever the strongest cipher suite is between X and Y. Now X and Y obviously is just a random uh, character that's put in, okay? Now, Note that if the server doesn't really support any of the protocols or the cipher suites, the, communi the communication or the connection will actually be dropped immediately. So this is actually um, a very important thing to note. Okay, now what is a cipher suite anyway? Now it comes, the cipher suite usually consists of three different things. Now the first thing is the key agreement protocol, which is something like RSA, Diffie-Hellman, elliptic curve, and so on. Um, then there is a symmetric encryption protocol, which is usually AES or stuff like that. Uh, finally, there is a hash function involved. Uh, so it's basically something like this, uh, KASE, hash, and so on. Uh, this is something that you can actually detect from your browser itself. Uh, so if you enter your browser and so the certificate, you can actually see what kind of encryption it is using. And we're gonna talk about that later on. Okay, so let's talk about the certificate exchange itself. So after the agreement, the server will exchange the certificate by sending it back to the client. This includes the public key, the domain, the expiration date, where all this is signed by the public key. Now, in the following slide, we'll see an example of certificate. Um, so in here on the left side, now this was taking a while back. So this was, I think, um, two years ago or something. So it was actually taken before the certificate is expired, which is why it stays valid, even though uh, we are in, I think, August, 2021. So this is why uh, it's not saying it's expired or anything like that. Um, as you can see, the CA is available at the top. Uh, it's DigiCert, as you can see. You can also see the expiration date of the certificate and whether or not it is valid. Now it's saying valid, as I mentioned, because it's an old one, okay? On the right side, you can see that my browsers uh, trust the CA until November 10th, 2031, as you can see at the top. Now, as I said earlier, if the CA got compromised, I will still trust all the certificates until 2031. So as you can imagine, this is actually a very risky thing to, to happen, okay? Okay, so moving on. Now let's talk about the session key establishment. Now after the server sends the certificate, the client will send a master secret key, which is called the session key establishment uh, essentially, okay? Okay, then comes something else. Here's the part where the secure communication actually starts. In this part, both the client and the server will use the cipher suites and protocols 
that they chose earlier going forward. So all the communication that's going to happen uh, from now on will actually be encrypted based on the agreement that uh, the client and the server chose. Okay. Now, this will actually lead to uh, the secure communication, at least hopefully, and this is the encrypted handshake. Okay, so let's talk about attacks on SSL version 2, okay? As I said earlier, it had many issues. Uh, some of the major vulnerabilities uh, in it is the Cypher Suites list that is sent from the client to the server, um, which was not authenticated meaning that an active attacker could modify the message and change the cipher suite to something else, such as a nice a null cipher or an export piece. Now, here's a quick demonstration. Now, in the client hello, the client says that it speaks TLS 1.0, okay, and supports cipher suite X and Y. Okay, now an active adversary is performing a man in the middle attack in this case where he can change the client hello by saying that the client speaks only with no cipher and SSL version two, okay? Now the server will have no option but to accept the communication with the weak encryption, unless of course it doesn't support it, where the communication will be dropped, okay? So in this case, we actually communicated with the null cipher which is basically no encryption at all, and SSL version 2, even though TLS 1.0 was an option. Now, as I mentioned earlier, all this will only happen if and only if the server actually accepts SSL version 2. Okay, now let's talk about export keys. So we've mentioned them briefly, but we didn't really explain what they are. So Let's go and do that. So export keys are 40-bit ciphers that the US government created and required all US products uh, to have it before being exported out of the country with the intention for it to be very weak so that they can break it easily. Now, the export keys were only sent overseas. So basically any country other than the US that wanted encryption got the export keys by default. It was later discovered that this was actually a very bad idea because it was broken easily, even by hackers as well, not only by the US government. In 2004, Home Computer was able to break the export keys in under two weeks. In 2021, I think it will be a much, much faster than that. In fact, DeepCrack, which is a hardware dedicated for it, uh, was able to break the export keys in seconds in 1998. So even in 1998, this thing was actually a bad idea. So you can imagine how bad this thing was. Okay, so in 2015, a statistic proved that about 30% of the servers in the wild still use export cipher suites. Now, this is actually a huge number. Uh, this means that it is still being used until today, which is very, very weird. However, the good news is modern browsers today no longer support export ciphers, which means that the connection will likely be dropped even from the client side, which is much, much better. Nevertheless, you can actually still use curl or wget and get away with it. So you can actually be uh, able to use it even though the browser don't, which put us to this point. Please, if you haven't done so already, batch your server, do not use export keys at all. Okay, so SSL version two was deprecated in 2011, so you should not even use it in 2021. It's been a long time that it has been deprecated. Unfortunately, I've actually seen this in real engagements recently. So there are still entities that will actually uh, use SSL version 2, even though we are in 2021. So this is how bad things are, okay? Okay, so let's go to SSL version 3. Now, all of the problems of SSL version 2 has been fixed in SSL version 3. However, the communication between the client and the server is now authenticated using um, a MAC, which is a message authentication code, so attackers can't really change it, which is good. 
Nevertheless, this, the change cipher spec message is not actually included in the Mac, which means that attackers can now read your traffic because he can change the ciphers again. <laughs> now, more text will be explained later on the next slide, in, in the next slide. So let's go to that. Now, there's the, uh, as I said, there's backward compatibility uh, between the two, um, I mean, between protocols in general, uh, SSL or TLS and so on. So this is something called version rollback. So it is actually a feature that SSL has. So it's not meant to be um, a vulnerability or anything. It is a feature that they had. Now, the release of SSL version three didn't make SSL version two browsers to go away immediately. It took years for that to happen. Uh, now, this is the first thing that you have to understand. Um, servers actually still accepted SSL version two requests, even though um, they have SSL version three now, which means that the attacker could specify SSL version two and actually perform SSL version two attacks on SSL version three. Now, this is actually very bad. Now, if you have SSL version two and TLS 1.3 or and at the same server, you can actually do the communication through SSL version two. So this is why it's very bad to have it, even if you have the strongest cipher or protocol, okay? Okay, so there is also another thing uh, interesting here. There is something called traffic analysis, which is an attack that can happen or happened earlier with SSL version three, um, which was also one of the major issues in this protocol itself. Now with all requests, an attacker can see the size of the HTTP request that's going on. Now this may allow him to guess things such as um, the file the user downloaded by its size, obviously if he has access to that file as well, uh, the visited URL because it is something that is accessible as well. Now, this thing is even worse when it comes to voice over IP. Um, anyone can tell me why? No one. Um, uh, actually, Ryan, we are not allowing anyone to talk. No, no, I mean, even in the chat, it's fine. Yeah, in the chat, in the chat, in the chat people can answer. Me, but I get somebody else. No, it's not the protocol, it's something else. Now, we're talking about traffic analysis, so we can actually see the traffic going on. Basically, we can see the size. Now, when it comes to voice over IP, we're actually thinking about something else. No, it is encrypted. The data is encrypted. The communication itself is encrypted. It's something more interesting than just that. Since you know the size, now what is interesting about people is usually when they talk, they pose after each word, right? Which means that an attacker may perform traffic analysis to decrypt the message based on that, right? Now, how is this fixed? you're gonna use something called padding. For those of you who don't know padding, padding is basically adding something um, to the communication, or if you have a block that is, let's say um, 122 bits, and the message is only 20 bits, you can add, um, so basically you're gonna do 128 minus 20, and you have, you're gonna have 180 worth of padding. No, it's not like SSH, it's a different thing. Okay. Now, as I said, the silence of the words between every word and another, this will actually do um, very badly when it comes to voice over IP. Okay, we mentioned how this is fixed and let's go forward. So now SSL version three had another major problem uh, which is weak ciphers. It had weak ciphers all the way. So it is true that it didn't use export ciphers because that was in SSL version two. However, there are a lot of weak ciphers out there. So it's not only export ciphers, it's not only null, there are a lot of others as well, okay? Um, 
In fact, SSL version 3 and below only supported cipher suites that were affected by Poodle, which is padding oracle attack, which is an attack that I'm going to talk about later on. Okay. Now, the only cipher that was not affected was the RC4 cipher, which actually leaked information um, and it was actually broken. So this means that it is even worse than the other ciphers as well. As a result of all this, SSL version 3 was deprecated in 2015, uh, which means that you should not use it in 2021 as well. Unfortunately, again, um, I've also seen this in real engagements recently, so people are still using SSL version 3, even though um, it is deprecated a while back. Okay, so let's talk about a real scenario. How do you use or how do you visit Google usually? Do you enter HTTP column slash slash www.google.com? People don't usually do that, right? So most people just do google.com, right? So what's the problem here? Anyone knows? Now, Google by default is using HTTPS, right? Yes, exactly. Redirection, but redirection to what? Nope, it's not a DNS attack. Yes, redirection to the HTTPS. So a redirection from HTTP to HTTPS, meaning that if you go to google.com, you're actually going to um, HTTP google.com. You're not going to the encrypted version, right? So you're gonna make a request to port 80 in this case, which will redirect you to port 443, which is the HTTPS version of it, right? Now, the first request, as I said, that you sent is actually not encrypted, meaning that the attacker can actually manipulate it and do um, other things as well, right? Okay. Now let's go to the solution basically, right? Um, there's something called HTTP strict transport security, okay? This has been created a while, a while ago. Um, if it is enabled at the server and your browser has already contacted the server before using a secure communication, it will never send an HTTP request to that server even if you did google.com right away, right? Basically what it does is that it will pin this website to always use HTTPS. It will not allow you to use HTTP at all, okay? Now, the downside for this, anyone knows? What's the downside for it? The downside for the HSCS? Nope, you cannot do that. Nope. Not processing power. So the downside is something called trust on first use. So if a man in the middle attacker was able to manipulate the request before you your first visit to the website, you are doomed. HSTS will not help you there, right? Because it will only help you if you already visited the website through HS HTTPS, basically. Yes, it is usually done through HTTP header, but you need to basically uh, configure it correctly. Okay. Now, there is something interesting, interesting with um, Google Chrome specifically. Um, to prevent this downside, partially at least, um, Google Chrome actually has a list of websites that it will always connect to via HTTPS. Basically, a preloaded list, exactly. Now, I don't know if all browsers have that. I'm definitely sure that Chrome has it. Uh, I think it is the only one, I might be wrong, but this is actually a very interesting way of doing things from Google, okay? Okay, 
Um, let's talk about encryption in general, in general before we jump back into SSL version 3, okay? So if I have this message, so M1, 2, M6 in this case, um, if we encrypted it, it creates the ciphertext from C1 to C6, right? Now, the fact that this message will always lead to the ciphertext is actually called deterministic encryption, which is bad. I'm going to tell you why in a minute, okay? Now, here's an example. So, we mentioned padding earlier, and as you can see here, you can kind of see a pattern, okay? This gets even worse with images, which we will talk about later on, but as you can see, uh, the letter A will always be this red box, even though you don't actually know the details, you may be able to guess it, okay? Um, B is always gonna be this box. Uh, A, as you can see, it's gonna be the same, right? Because it's the same um, red box. And then padding is black in this case. Now, of course, these colors are something that I've actually um, written or put in the slides. It's not really gonna be like this with, with real encryption, but this is just a graphical representation of how things are going on. Okay. Okay, so let's go and see why is this is it even worse when it comes to images and stuff like that. Now, here's a real uh, life scenario. Now, this image was encrypted using AES ECB mode, which is the standard AES uh, encryption. Now, AES, if you don't know, has a lot of modes of, op of operation. Uh, ECB is basically the basic version. If you didn't put any mode of operation, it's going to be a ECB mode by default. Now, ECB mode is deterministic by default. So it is, it is a deterministic encryption algorithm. And as you can see from the image, uh, we can actually see what the message is saying, even though it is encrypted, right? Okay, so. Now, ideally, what you want to use is something called semantic security. Basically, an encryption algorithm is secure if an attacker who sees the ciphertext learns as much as an attacker who does not see the ciphertext. Now, even if an attacker can request a chosen plaintext. Now, with deterministic encryptions, as we mentioned earlier, okay, if you have something like the alphabets or let's say the cards, there's only 52 options of cards out there, right? Um, you don't want the, the deterministic encryption here, right? Because people will actually know uh, what card you actually played with and you can even tell the alphabet from there, right? Okay, so what is the solution to the earlier problem? Okay, one solution is to add randomization through something called the initialization vector or IV in this case. Uh, basically, you want to add a different IV in each block, okay? One example for this is the CBC mode of AES, which we will talk about next. Okay, so uh, don't worry, it's not complicated as it seems, but here's uh, the CBC mode graphical uh, encryption part. Now, as I mentioned, it comes into blocks. So each block is 128 bits um, in size. Now, if the plain text is actually more than 128, it's gonna be shipped into uh, different blocks where each block is 128 bits each, okay? Now, there is something called the IV, which is gonna be um, a pseudo random generated, um, basically a secure uh, pseudo random generated data, where it's gonna also be 128 bits long, right? Now you're gonna XOR the plain text with the IV and then use the encryption algorithm with a key, obviously, which will give you 
128 block of ciphertext. Now, this ciphertext will be the new IV for the second block. And then you're going to do the same process and so on, right? Now, if you have, let's say, um, if you have the first block to be 128 and the second block 28 bits only, you're going to have 100 bits worth of padding, obviously, right? Now, this is an important thing to know, right? I'm going to tell you why in a minute, OK? Now, there's something called a padding oracle attack, OK, uh, which basically allows an attacker to decrypt the data without knowing the encryption key. Now, this is a little bit complicated, but I'm going to try to explain it um, Basically, um, assuming that an attacker was able to capture the ciphertext and the destination returns a meaningful message when the padding is wrong, okay? Now, the important thing, this is why it's called a padding oracle attack. The oracle meaning that the oracle will tell you, hey, this is wrong, this is right, and so on, okay? Now, if an attacker was able to capture the ciphertext, assuming that you have Wireshark or whatever you want to do, and then you capture the whole HTTPS traffic. But when you try to send it back to the server, the destination returns a meaningful message saying that, hey, this padding is wrong or stuff like that. Then you have, uh, or let's say valid or invalid and so on. Uh, now this happens during the deciphering or decrypting process, right? Because when you send something that the server will decrypt, it will only decrypt it if it was valid, okay? Uh, and you want the server to decrypt it to be able to see the uh, information from it, right? Now, you only have for ASCII characters, 256 unique uh, characters, basically, okay? So it's really easy to have a loop that will go through the 256 unique characters until you have the correct padding, okay? So if you looked at the last byte, okay, at the end of the ciphertext, until the oracle says that the padding is correct, you actually have the right padding. Now you move on to the next character from the back and do the whole thing again. And then eventually, you're gonna move on to the first character and then byte by byte, the plain text will actually be revealed, right? So SSL version three was actually um, vulnerable to this poodle or padding oracle attack. Now all the communication has been decrypted by then, right? Okay, now to test for it, you can actually do it with a lot of things. You can do it even with Nmap. Now, Nmap has an NSE script, as can, see, as can be seen from the screenshot, that will actually detect the, um, the poodle if it works. Now, it's not going to decrypt it for you, but it's just going to tell you that it is vulnerable or, or not, okay? Alternatively, you can use Metasploit to scan for it, or you can use a lot of tools out there. There is even POCs for this attack in GitHub. If you want, you can use them. Um, just have a note that I will not actually exploit it. It will only show you um, that it is vulnerable. So I'm talking about Metasploit and Nmap specifically, but I've seen uh, scripts in GitHub that will actually do the exploitation for you, okay? Also, alternatively, or alternatively, you can actually create one yourself. I've actually wrote an exploit um, in Golang when I was in college. It actually exploited Poodle vulnerability. Uh, it was actually very fun to implement. So if you have time, you may want to try it. It's actually an interesting attack to use. If you want to use Metasploit, as I mentioned, it's only going to do the scanning for you. Uh, this is the model that you want to use in Metasploit to get the same result as Nmap. Um, you don't have to use Metasploit or Nmap. You can use other scripts, as I mentioned earlier. OK, let's go on. 
Okay, so what is the solution to the earlier problem? Okay, now the first solution for the problem is removing the invalid padding or MAC message instead of solving the main issue, right? This is what TLS or SSL did. They actually removed the message instead of, instead of solving the issue, right? This was their first solution. Can anyone think what can go wrong here? Spoiler alert, this was actually bad. They removed the message that says invalid padding, right? But they didn't solve the main issue, okay? How do you attack it if you don't have someone that tells you, hey, this is invalid or this is valid? Can anyone think of a way? No one? Okay. Uh, you are close enough, but it's not the size. It's something else. Nope. Not the IV. It's also something related to analysis, but it's now you're analyzing something else. So it's not the traffic itself, you're actually analyzing something else. Okay, I'm gonna give you about a minute to think about it. Okay, let's repeat the question. So, as I mentioned here, padding oracle attack worked because there is an oracle that will actually tells you that the padding is correct or the padding is not correct, okay? What SSL v3 did to solve this issue is removing the message that's saying this is valid or this is invalid. I'm saying that this is not enough. Not the checksum. Nope. It's actually something really interesting. So I'm just gonna give you the solution now. Time, okay? Time is actually a big factor here, right? You can actually calculate the time and do time analysis to know whether or not this is a valid padding or invalid padding, right? Now, padding or contact even worked even when they solved the message just because there is the time as well, which was different between an invalid padding and a valid one, right? So as I mentioned, this was not the correct solution or the best solution and they figured it out too late, essentially. Okay, so what is the best solution for this? You can have multiple approaches to solve this issue. Uh, the first one is you can have different mode of operation entirely other than CBC mode in this case, or you can display a generic message with a delay. Now a delay here will act um, as something that basically if you have, let's say valid padding or invalid padding, you want them to be on the same time basically, right? So if it took five seconds to give you the invalid padding, message, you want it to take five seconds as well to give you a valid padding one, right? Now, you should not give the message that will actually say this is valid and this is invalid, obviously, uh, but at the same time, you should add a delay. So a generic message with a delay is actually fine. The best approach with all this is to implement something called encrypt then Mac. This will result 
in the ciphertext being dropped if it was tampered with, even with CBC mode, okay? So the fact that people say CBC mode is insecure is not entirely correct. This is, there is an insecure implementation of it, and there is a secure one. So this is why um, things are going bad with SSL version 3. Okay, so enough with SSL, and now let's talk about TLS, okay? Okay, so TLS 1.0. Now, as I mentioned earlier, due to the rollback feature, TLS 1.0 allowed for downgrading the connection into SSL version 3, which also downgrades to SSL version 2, and so on, okay? This basically introduces all the vulnerabilities of the previous protocols again. Now, obviously, I'm not going to cover them again since we have already covered them. Uh, however, TLS 1.0 is also vulnerable to uh, some interesting vulnerabilities as well, such as Beast and the Drown attack, which we will be explaining later on. Now, as I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, I'm not going to explain all the attacks that are out there. Uh, there are more attacks, okay? Uh, this is just merely a couple of them. Okay, so the drown attack. So let's start with the drown attack, okay? Now, the drown attack mainly touches SSL version 2. However, due to the compatibility feature, some TLS 1.0 was actually vulnerable. Uh, Basically, it requires SSL version 2 to exist in the server side. Um, now, this was discovered in 2016, so it was a recent one. And at the time of the, at the, time of the discovery, 33% of the web servers were actually vulnerable to this attack. In 2019, it seems that 1.2% of all web servers are actually still vulnerable to this attack, okay? So let's see it in action. Um, okay, so this attack is actually a bit more complicated um, than just this picture, but I'm just gonna try to simplify it here as much as I can. Um, so if you want to grasp the whole details about the attack, you would need to go very deep with mathematic, mathematics and encryptions and crypto in general and so on, uh, which is a bit out of the scope of the presentation. Um, but I'm trying to simplify things here, so I'm just gonna go over it real quick. So to begin with, uh, DROWN stands for decrypting RSA with obsolete and weakened encryption, okay? The DROWN attack could allow a man in the middle attacker to decrypt the session, basically, session key, um, and discover the session key and so on. Uh, this attack is not an easy one to pull off, in my opinion. Um, and even if we have SSL version 2 or can downgrade to it, um, there are much faster and better attacks that we can deploy and pull off instead of this one, okay? Anyway, uh, the attack requires the attacker to send uh, about more than 10,000 packets to the server, okay? And it will take hours to decrypt the public key used as well. Now, you can expedite this process by having, um, um, like, let's say a lot of servers, AWS um, cloud-based instances, and that they actually do this for you. It's going to make it a little bit easier and faster, but it's still going to be a, um, a lot of time to do. Now, recall that the client will encrypt the secret key with the server's key during the handshake, the TLS handshake, as you remember and it will send it back to the server, right? If the server tries to decrypt it and it was invalid, it will immediately close the connection, right? Now, this means that an attacker can perform a kind of a brute force attack to find the key. Uh, this eventually will allow the attacker to decrypt all the future communications by just having this secret key. Now, as a reminder, this would only work if the server actually allows SSL version 2 connections as well as TLS 1.0, okay? Um, the picture and the credits and some demo uh, that actually is a real live demo can be found in this YouTube video. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the slides will be available for you to see. Um, so you can actually go and watch the video if you want 
uh, it is very interesting. Uh, he actually set up a lab to actually do this drown attack and so on, okay? Okay, let's move to uh, another attack that is called Beast. The Beast attack only works against CBC mode and it affects TLS 1.0 and the versions before it that uses CBC mode, basically. The only way to prevent Beast attack from the server side is to enable RC4, which as I mentioned earlier is even worse. Okay, now this makes enabling TLS 1.0 a bad idea as well. Um, so you should not have 1.0 in 2021. Um, recall that in CBC mode, the previous cipher text will be uh, the ID in the next block, which kind of makes it predictable if you can control uh, the plain text somehow. Now, this attack is kind of like something called a chosen plain text attack. Uh, basically, it requires a man in the middle attacker to inject some JavaScript or anything on the HTTP enabled website uh, that will make the client make another request to the HTTPS version or to the HTTPS website you're targeting uh, in order to perform this attack. So an active man in the middle attacker can predict the IV uh, by doing so, therefore making the result of the encryption deterministic and basically um, leaking data from the encryption itself. Technically, an attacker will not be able to decrypt the whole communication. Uh, however, he can find out if his guessing is right or wrong, uh, one block at a time, because as I mentioned, CBC uh, is basically 128 bits for each block. So he may be able to discover some uh, plain text from some of the blocks, but not all of them, okay? Okay, let's go to the uh, risk actually of this. Uh, now, guessing, to be honest, is not really efficient, and all browsers currently address it using a technique called one over n minus one split. Um, in this case, the first packet will be padded with random data before being combined with the initialization vector. As you can see, uh, now there are two uh, different packets here. The first one only contains the key, which is only one uh, bit basically, or one byte. Now, with this in mind, this means that the risk from the beast attack currently is actually very low because no browsers uh, are actually vulnerable to this uh, vulnerability or this attack anymore at the moment of this presentation. Now, of course, as I mentioned, you can use curl, wget, and so on, but it's still, it's not really realistic or um, an interesting attack, honestly. It's just interesting uh, or interesting in paper, but not really in practice, I guess. Okay. All right, moving on. Let's go to uh, TLS 1.1. Now, just so you know, you can actually get away with TLS 1.1 with certain rules. Um, in fact, Google until today still uses TLS 1.1, even though there is 1.2 and 1.3 out there, okay? Uh, now, I'm not saying that you should keep using it. Uh, it is an old protocol already, but if you need it, or if you need to have it for any reason, you should be fine given that you have done the following. First thing, you have to disable all the insecure software suites on the protocol. Uh, this is actually the main issue with TLS in general, including TLS 1.2 and TLS 1.3. Uh, now, imagine having a null cipher with TLS 1.2. Uh, does that make your connection secure? Not really. Um, however, keep in mind that disabling some ciphers may or may not introduce other problems with legacy systems. Uh, I've actually been in an environment once uh, where I told them to disable a cipher suite and it broke one of their uh, most important services that they have. Um, so this is why, now this was because they were using a very old version of Java, right? Um, what I did then is to ask them to put an exception for that system until they decide to upgrade it eventually, which they should. Uh, by doing that, the rest of their systems can actually be protected and the business will still be running. So it is very important to understand what your changes can affect um, or 
what your changes um, have effects on the services or the servers that the client has or the company you're working on or the entity, whatever you're, wherever you're working. Um, because cybersecurity is actually meant to be an enabler uh, for the business, not the other way around, okay? Okay, so anyway, the second thing is that you must not have SSL version three or version two enabled in your server. Otherwise, a rollback can occur, which will break your security again, okay? Um, also, a note for legacy systems. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Okay, so in here, um, browsers have actually ended support for TLS 1.0 and 1.1 uh, in 2021. I believe Google waited until early 2021, uh, but we are currently in August 2021. So all browsers now ended support for TLS 1.0 and 1.1, right? Uh, this means that this is bad news for legacy systems. Uh, they would have to be upgraded or they won't be able to be used easily in the future, okay? Moreover, um, some entities like to have a rating to their overall TLS or SSL security and Qualys SSL labs provide just that. Uh, does TLS 1.0 the grading? Yes, it does. Okay. Um, some entities like to have, as I mentioned, um, a rating. However, now Qualys have decided to decrease your rating if you still support TLS 1.0 and TLS 1.1. Now this is a recent thing that they did. Uh, this was not the case a year ago. Uh, right now it is the case. Um, as I said earlier, I would, I would recommend testing everything before disabling those protocols. So don't really worry about the rating, just worry about uh, how things can affect your business basically, okay? Uh, because it actually may break things if you still have legacy systems in your organization. So you just gonna have to be careful with that. Okay, so we've mentioned Heartbleed briefly at the start of the presentation, but we didn't really talk about it then. Okay, so before we do that, let's explain something very important. Okay, um, Open SSL is an application that implements TLS or SSL. The majority of servers worldwide uses Open SSL to enforce um, SSL or TLS. Okay, Heartbleed was a vulnerability uh, in the Open SSL cryptography library, so not the TLS protocol itself. So it is not related to the protocol itself. It's just an issue that happened with one of the libraries that OpenSSL uh, had, okay? Uh, now the issue was introduced in 2012. It was publicly disclosed in 2014. So the, it has been introduced two years before the, exp the exposure basically. Um, the main reason behind the vulnerability is an invalid validation of the boundary used, okay? Uh, this is actually something called um, buffer overread. This is actually the correct uh, name of this vulnerability. Now, in 2019, which is about two years ago, Shodan showed that there are still more than 90,000 uh, devices that are still vulnerable to heartbleed, okay? I actually saw this in an engagement last year. So there are still servers in real world that have this vulnerability available. So heartbleed essentially, okay? Now let's go to the next slide. Okay, so basically um, when you use OpenSSL, you are securing a socket between you and the server, okay? Um, in general, a server can only accept and keep alive a number of sockets at the same time. It terminates a socket after a certain threshold if there's no more activities and the client will have to renegotiate over and over again. Now, as you can imagine, as you can imagine this is actually um, a pain uh, to do, okay? 
uh, having to have the, the handshake all over again is actually not a good idea. Oh, well, let's see how things were, uh, how things ended up. So to avoid, to avoid having this renegotiation re problem and provide a keep alive um, functionality without continuous data transfer as required, uh, they introduced something called the heartbeat extension, okay? Now, the heartbeat can contain anything up to 64 kilobytes of data. This is actually a very important thing to note. Let's see um, some normal usage and a malicious usage, usage for this as well in the next slide. Okay, now, for the normal usage here, there is an attacker who is a good guy in this uh, in this phase specifically. Now he basically sends a one kilobyte of data and says it is one kilobyte. Now the server will return the same one kilobyte that the attacker sent initially. Okay. Now let's see the malicious usage. Now, in this case, the attacker is sending a one kilobyte worth of data and saying that it is 64 kilobytes worth of, worth of data, okay? Now, let's see a better figure uh, for this problem in the next slide, which I've taken from Wikipedia. Now, in this case, as you can see in this part, the client sent the word bird, okay, and told the server it is 500 letters, okay? The server will then provide the word bird and add to it a random data from memory up to 64 kilobytes of data. Now, this data may include passwords, it may include private keys or other information. So this may or may not be useful uh, depending on what's the information in memory at the time, at the time of the exploit. Um, in this case, you can see that the server master key is blah, blah, blah. User Carol wants to change password to blah, blah, blah. And you can see that the password has been exposed and the master key has been exposed as well. Okay. So let's talk about exploiting Heartbleed if you saw it in the wild. There are a lot of tools that actually do that, that, that can actually do that for you. Uh, one of them is Metasploit. Okay. Now, it is one of the easiest ones uh, that you can use to do this. Now, this is um, a server that it's vulnerable, and I exploited it. You can see some data from it, uh, basically. Um, so this is how heart, Heartbeat works. Now, the extension is called OpenSSL underscore Heartbeat. It will exploit the Heartbeat and give you back the random data that it is leaked. Note that every time you run it, you may get different results. So the result that you got initially may not be uh, the same when you rerun it. So you're just gonna have to uh, basically rerun the exploit until you get something useful. You may be lucky and get something useful at the first run, uh, but this is not usually the case. Okay, so let's now talk about how to check for other uh, weaknesses in SSL or TLS. Okay, so there are a couple of ways to check for the versions and the cipher suites. Uh, there are websites and tools that can help you with that, depending on what you want to do. Uh, from my experience, I've seen that Nmap NSE scripts, uh, Test SSL, and Qualys SSL Labs are the best. Uh, the latter may have possible privacy concerns for uh, some of you, because your website will actually be accessed by a, a cloud provider. Um, another issue with it, it is that if you are testing a local website, uh, you will not be able to actually access it from remotely from Qualys SSL Labs. So in that case, you're going to have to either, either use this test SSL or Nmap or any other script you want to use. Okay. Now note that these are not the only tools out there. You can use anything that you like um, that provides the same results. There are tons of them, but I just like these three. Um, you may like something else. This doesn't mean it's wrong. Uh, feel free to do, to use or do whatever you like for testing. Okay, so let's see a couple uh, of the tools in action. So let's start with Nmap SSL uh, checker. 
Now, nmap is not really convenient because it requires you to use two NAC scripts because it uses different one, uh, a different one for SSL version two and the rest. So the first one is um, an, an NAC script called SSL v2. Okay. Uh, now this will only work on servers that supports SSL version two, and it will not check for other versions as well. So if you have TLS 1.0 or SSL version three in the same server, it will not actually check for it. It will only check for SSL version two, uh, which is why I'm saying that nmap is not really convenient for this, okay? For SSL uh, version three and above, we will be using something else with nmap. Um, we will be using something called um, SSL enum ciphers where you will do, now this is the syntax basically for it. Um, as you can see, uh, the nice thing with nmap is that it will actually rate the ciphers for you and show all the protocols that are supported, right? So you have TLS 1.0 here, you have 1.1 and 1.2. The ciphers of each protocol are listed here. There's a rating for them. Um, so far, it's very good. Um, we we'll also at the end provide you with the rating of your least strength cipher, okay? Um, I know that a rating of A is not a, a lot of fun for an attacker. So let's see something, um, I, I don't wanna say more interesting. Let's just gonna say, I'm just gonna say something worse, okay? Okay, so can anyone tell me what is the problem here? Okay, grade C is one, but you didn't see D and E. I'm seeing a couple of issues here. So, first of all, you actually have SSL version three protocol, right? This is an issue by itself. Those with the rating of E are actually export ciphers, as you can imagine. Okay. Um, those with D are actually another export ciphers, but are a little bit stronger. Okay. Now those with C, are actually very weak and it can be broken, okay? And at the end, you can see that the least strength server, um, the least strength cipher is rated as E, okay? I already mentioned this, this, and this. Okay, now let's go and check uh, test SSL, which is another interested, interesting tool. Um, Test SSL is a very powerful open source uh, batch script, okay? What I like about it is that you don't have to switch between two scripts like we did with nmap. Um, it tests for a lot of things, including the supported protocols, uh, the supported cipher, cipher suites, and um, those that make us an issue, basically. It also checks for the server performance uh, in terms of cipher suites in order, it will actually list them for you. Um, you're gonna see the HTTP headers and even um, SSL and TLS vulnerabilities that can occur. So here's an example. This is a snippet of test SSL. As you can see, the server does not offer SSL version two, um, neither SSL version three. It offers TLS 1.0 and 1.1 and 1.2, okay? Um, here it, it shows that it does not support null ciphers or export ciphers and so on. So as you can see, it is actually a very uh, interesting way of showing the data, okay? Now it also shows something else. It also shows 
uh, the vulnerability. So it will actually test for hard bleed. Basically, it will not exploit it, uh, but it will actually, um, ha it has a checker basically that will check for those, but it, they will not be exploited. Now, in this case, hard bleed was not uh, there. It was the website or the, or the server was not vulnerable to hard bleed. Um, now, be a breach, crime, and stuff like that are other uh, vulnerabilities that are available uh, for TLS. You can actually do your research on them. Uh, breach is, the, I say, an interesting one that you may want to uh, go on and do some research. As you can see, Poodle here, um, it is not vulnerable. So, break, drown, and so on. Okay. Okay. So, here is another snippet from the same tool. So the tool will actually give you all this information. Um, in this case, it will actually tell you uh, the server preference. As I said, that the server will have a certain preference, which is usually the strongest the strongest uh, protocol and the strongest cipher suite. The client will also, will also have a uh, certain preference as well. In this case, um, the server likes TLS 1.2 and likes this cipher as well. Now it has, it will also list all the uh, protocols with its uh, ciphers in order. So if the client decided to negotiate with uh, TLS v1, it will actually use this. If it chose 1.1, it will use this and so on. You can see how this script is actually very nice and very handy uh, script to have. Okay, now let's talk about Qualys SSL Labs. Uh, Qualys SSL Labs is actually a free website created by Qualys to test the SSL and TLS strength of websites. Um, it gives each website a rating from A plus to F based on the strength of the supported protocols and cipher suites as well. It also gives detailed information about what is weak exactly uh, in the TLS or SSL uh, of your server or website. Now, keep in mind that this means that you are using a cloud-based website. If you are not careful, even other people can actually see your search query. Um, this is why there is this checkbox uh, where it says do not show the results. Otherwise, it's going to be here in the uh, recently scanned um, websites essentially. Okay. Now you may or may not be okay with it. Uh, so just be careful with this. Um, it is very important to be aware of this fact. There's a way for you to hide it, as I mentioned, but again, it is a cloud, uh, based website. So your data is actually being sent over there. Uh, it's known to them that someone is actually scanning it and so on. I'm not saying it's bad. I'm just saying it depends on your scenario. Maybe you have a secret website that you don't want anyone to use, to know about. Uh, then it's not a good idea to do that. Another side effect, as I mentioned earlier, is the fact that this is a cloud website or an online version of it, uh, meaning that if you are testing for local uh, web servers, this will not actually be applicable or usable for you. Okay. Okay. So lastly, this is uh, two screenshots that I've taken from Qualys SSL Labs. Um, SSL, uh, Qualys SSL Labs is actually uh, a very interesting uh, website and a very um, handful one of it as well. So the screenshot was actually taken, um, basically the one above was taken um, on December 31st of 2019 specifically. You can see the date over here. I know it's not really clear. Um, it's showing google.com with a grade of A, as you can see here, uh, even with the support of TLS 1.0 and 1.1, okay? On the other hand, the one below was taken in, was taken, um, in August 17th, 2021, uh, showing Google with a grade of B um, due to its support of TLS 1.0 and 1.1, as you mentioned earlier, okay? Now, you can see all the details about the certificate, uh, start date, 
um, in date issuer supported protocols, ciphers, and so on, and much more with the Koala SSL Lab. It's actually a very interesting um, website. Another interesting thing about it is that it has a huge database, uh, which gives them the ability to provide statistics. Now, if we sold this uh, data in here, as you can see, uh, most websites support TLS 1.2, as you can see here. This is 1.2, so about 99 or 90% of the web. Uh, basically, it is based on um, the survey that they have, which consists of 136,000 websites. Uh, this data has been taken from it, basically, okay? Now, as I mentioned, most websites currently uh, support TLS 1.2, uh, about 50% or so supports um, TLS 1.3 and 1.1. And then about 40% supports TLS 1.0 still. And it seems that less than 5% still supports SSL version three and two, okay? Now, keep in mind that this does not include websites that are not publicly exposed. Um, now, also note that this is only for the websites that have been scanned by Qualys SSL Labs and not all the websites on the internet, okay? Uh, the survey also, as I mentioned, only consists of about 136,000 uh, websites only. Um, I think we are done. So if you guys have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Um, we still have a couple minutes. Thank you so much, Ryan. I appreciate that, man. It was really, really great uh, presentation, as well as uh, you know information that you explained and uh, sh you shared with us. Uh, I appreciate it, actually. Uh, yes, as you said, uh, anyone has a question, please uh, go ahead and ask it, or you can even uh, speak on the mic, right, uh, Atif? Yeah, if anyone has any question, they can just unmute their mic and please go ahead. And it's better for you, Mr. Ryan, right? Yeah, yeah, that's fine. You can, if you don't want to talk, you can just put in the chat. I'm going to be happy to answer them as well. Exactly. Yeah. All the option is open here. <laughs> yep. Hello, everyone. My name is Amr. How is everybody doing? Great. Good. Thank you, Ryan, for the great uh, presentation. Although I would, uh, I'm going to admit uh, that it's a little bit above my uh, above my expertise, but I really gained a lot of knowledge. Uh, would oh, it good. be possible? Thank you so much. Would it would it be possible to share the? Um, because I found a lot of useful information that's a little bit above my level. Would it mm -hmm. be possible to share the, the the slides for me so I can take yeah, my sure. time to re research each bit? Sure, sure. I'm going to be sharing the slides with uh, OWASP and yes. they'll be happy to distribute it, I guess. I don't know how this process works. Yeah, uh, we'll, this is... we'll be posting it on our Twitter account as well as LinkedIn. So you can find Perfect. it. Perfect. Perfect. Thank, thank you so much. I appreciate that. Yes. No problem. Uh, moreover, we'll also be having uh, the recording of the video. So even uh, if any one of you wants to watch the session again, this is also available. That would be helpful. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks. And uh, I believe Ryan will also be available if there are any questions after the session. He is there uh, through his Twitter account. He sure. can also answer. Uh, Atif, well, the recording will be available on YouTube channel, right? YouTube, yes. And we'll post it on Twitter and as well as Telegram channel. As well. And actually, uh, everyone is welcome to follow us on Twitter as well as LinkedIn and uh, Telegram group as well. So you guys can be, uh, uh, well, I mean, posted and updated with all uh, coming uh, event. 
for a wash period. Okay, I guess uh, the questions were asked in between the talk. A lot of things people answered as well. And we are really thankful, Rayan, uh, for your wonderful presentation. And thanks, everyone, for attending the session. And uh, inshallah, hopefully, see you guys again uh, for the next presentation. Thank you, Rayan. Thank you again. Uh, Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Rayan. Wallah, Jack, and Fair. Wallah, Salam. Wallah, Salam. Yeah, hello. Thank you.